Look at the 9.5 million houses in this area. I'm spending 190 billion versus 10 billion. And as an actuary or a business person or an insurance person, I'm like, well, I'd rather spend the 10 billion fixing it than 190 making sure it doesn't happen. So it goes back to that human element and mindset. And who pays that? That 190 to make it stronger isn't the insurance company paying for it. It's the developer, it's the builder, it's the homeowner, and as you increase costs, fewer people can afford homes. So now you're impacting affordability and homeownership, which makes the building industry associations very twitchy. We don't like it. We don't like it when it costs more to own homes. But we know, we've done studies. For every dollar invested, four dollars in cost savings. So it's just, how do you convince and usually I say in government it tends to be one pair of pants and two pockets. It's like this department's not talking to this department, but they're really related. In this instance, it's not even the same pair of pants because you have the insurance industry and you have local government and you have the consumer. So it's not even the same pair of pants, but it is the same planet. But again, that's not how we think. So looking at trends, one of the things that I like to see uh, it's a little bit big brother, so it does get freak some people out, but it's the communication that we see happening in cities and happening with infrastructure. So buildings that are communicating back, hey, I'm out of my uh, normal performance range, someone come check on me. It's the street light that's also reporting CO2 levels. It's the street light that also has cameras in it. You can get an app that shows you where parking is. So even though they're convenience, they are also reduced driving around or tell you to stay inside when it's not healthy outside. Up north, they use these to deploy snowmobiles. So they can tell based off of the cameras where the most impacted areas are to send the smoke snowmobiles there first to get the cities back up and running. So from them, their standpoint, again, it's a convenience and a strategy type thing but you can reduce emissions by doing it. Energy, back and forth. So again, central plants, energy, not the only way to go. So we need, again, from a durability standpoint, a national security standpoint, not to have all of our power located in this one area. To have our power plants feeding buildings and buildings that have excess power feeding back to the grid, it's all possible, it's just not sexy. And the power companies, again, big money, big government, PSC, you know, don't, don't step on their toes because you might not live through it. You might find yourself in the Everglades. Um, but again, not a lawyer, not talking about anything I happen to know about any power company people. Um, what we found after Sandy, Hurricane Sandy, was the ability to recharge our electronics was critical. So uh, at Hurricane Charlie, what we found was everyone, and that was 04, so everyone was now relying on cell phones, and guess what? Cell phone towers went down. So huge issue, unless you were Nextel. So that back in the day, that little beep, 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 walkie-talkie phone thing that everyone made up fun of, that worked during Charlie. Cell phone towers were down. What they found during Sandy was they had, the towers were working fine, just people were running out of power. They needed to recharge because there was no infrastructure powering the plug. So these little pods, recharging pods, actually were super, super high demand. So when we talk about land development, we're like, we need to design these in. It's a convenience thing, but it's very, very important. Walkability, multimodal transportation, California road gets taken out by an earthquake. You have millions of people just not going to work and or going to school and or making money and or going to hospitals. That's just the impact because we don't have options. We didn't design in options. Look at urban agriculture. And so one of the things that I think is unique or interesting, development, is development. We're taking land, we're turning it into something 
which I would consider more beautiful and useful, but a lot of people think just preserving it as is um, is the better way to go, but I'm a proponent of improving the land through development, not just changing it. So when I look, and this is where Babcock Ranch is located, at this project, which I've now been working on for about 11 years, and we just opened models this spring, so March is when we had kind of the grand opening. We've been planning and looking at how do you do this and how do you design this and thinking of, okay, a town of the future. What is a town of the future? What do you have to have? How can this town adapt? And so it is inland. So from a standpoint of durability and resiliency, lower wind loads. From a standpoint of the project and what was being developed versus preserved. So it was one of the largest land purchases um, in the state. It was like 92,000 acres, 74,000 went into permanent conservation. 19, 17,000 is being developed with 19,000 units, ballpark. I mean, there obviously are more specific numbers. But um, a significant amount was retained by the state, went into conservation with the other areas being developed. And so this actually exists now. <laughs> Apparently it's a movie. <laughs> Not just a picture. If I had used my picture, it would just be a picture. But this just showing you the drive-in, and I can tell you it actually, it looks very similar to this, but it doesn't because you see turf on this and you don't see turf out there. So they did a whole lot of native vegetation. They wanted low maintenance. And so they have environmental pillars, they have energy pillars. These are what their standing beliefs are. And so I can't say, uh, we're in a national land community. We have activities, we have walkability, we have nature, we have all of those things. What's different? The biggest focus that I've seen is the people connection um, and this 75 megawatt PV, right? And apparently these are automated. Okay. <laughs> it's just, it's key. Um, so, although we have the standard, what you would normally see in a national plan community, the things that you don't see are the fact that we have a live ranching operation going, and that we have the ability to get beef from our own cattle. We have organic farming going on, and the restaurant gets all of its vegetation from the organic farms. We have autonomous vehicles planned into the infrastructure. We have NEMA 1450 plugs in every garage for people to charge electric vehicles with. We have fiber to every house. So the things that the best we could do forward thinking with, of course, reasonable viability, because these are private investors doing a development that has to be financially viable. Um, and we're starting to get numbers back, we're starting to get feedback, but after 10, 11 years of planning and saying, what is this future town going to look like? The fact that 10 years ago we talked autonomous vehicles and we're negotiating that contract says a lot about the developer. The fact that, again, we have the PV array and we're, we're trying to get an additional 75 megawatts. So we're trying to double the PV array we have. What we have now will power the town when it's completely built out. But we want to generate more for the community. So those are the types of things that I kind of live in. This world of, I don't care why you do it, just do it. Make informed decisions. We know how to build better. We know how to design smarter. We know that there's value in this. And it's how do we translate that value. And it goes back to, you know, before no one cared about GMOs, no one cared about calories, no one cared about lead and paint. We just didn't know. We do now. So let's stop pretending we know. And that's really all I have to say. Um, I worked on Babcock also, but from the regulatory side, it was a 
And one question I had about the solar was, I know you, you know, you've got a great solar program, except I don't believe you have rooftop solar. Is there a reason for that? We allow rooftop solar. So okay. it's not required, and the, com the commercial buildings, so the buildings owned by the developer will have rooftop solar. The homes, it's up to the homeowner if they want it or not. Okay, but so, did you do anything to make that easier for them? I, we've coordinated with different uh, manufacturers to get bulk deals, so to speak, but quite honestly, it's the power company that drives a lot of that. So you could like, uh, try like, the feedback into your solar. Well, so, um, net metering is you have to do net metering. So that's, that's a given. You do have to do net metering. Okay. That's not an issue. Um, but the price of it is really, some homeowners are game for it. So we have houses, so Lennar and Pulte are now going in. So obviously lower price point. They're held to the same design standards. And then we have Fox Builders, local builders, were the first groups we got in. Uh, local community folks, so Charlotte Lee and Collier County Builders, and um, they're up to, you know, I'm sure six, seven hundred thousand. Some of those folks are fine with PVs. Yeah, and again, they're going on all the commercial buildings. I but it's said, up to the owner to decide, the homeowner to decide. It just as an house. offer to do it initially, to build it in, I thought it would be something that might interest some folks. Yeah, and again, it goes back to when the developer approached the builders and said, okay, we want every house to have X on it. The builders actually weren't as resistant as you would think because they said, well, if everyone has to do it, we're at least being compared apples to apples. But when we started having those conversations with FPL is when it started becoming an issue. And the complications of contracts and they had a contract with each individual builder. And we said, okay, you guys want to do it, you can do it, but we're not going to require it on homes. Commercial buildings, yes, but not on homes. So everything's fed from the PV array. So that's their kind of out, so to speak, is that daytime, solar, nighttime, natural gas. One more question. How does the cost of a, the average cost of a home in that, that corporate compares to the cost of a regular house in a regular subdivision? Uh, they're comparable. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm sure comparable to here, anywhere from two to as much as you want to spend, two hundred thousand to as, no, much, as, as much as you want to spend. Well, you sort of state of the art facility. Well, and again, so I will also tell you the homeowners association, <coughs> and, and this is the probably the most shocking thing. Um, their association dues are like fifty dollars a month, non-existent. And that was a commitment by the developer to say, no, we're not making the community pay for this stuff. We're taking this on. And we're keeping these association dues low. So that was their decision. It's, it's unheard of. These, the dues are 10% of what you normally find in a lot of these community, master plan community type neighborhoods. Now, will that change? I don't know, but that's what it is right now. 